saying hello Instagram and hello Facebook. I am live on both. All right, there we go. Okay. All right, uh, we'll give people a few minutes to uh, come on. I'm going to start right on time. I'm a firm believer on starting on time. And the reason I'm a firm believer in starting on time is because we we give our best to other things. So when we, when we, oh, let me say hi. When we uh, have something else we want to do, when we have something else we believe in strongly, when we have something else we desire, when we have something else we're committed to, we will show up early. If it's a concert, if it's a movie, if it's a restaurant, it doesn't matter what the thing is. If it's something that we love and something that we want, we will actually show up early to get in. So how much more should we serve the Lord with that kind of zeal? Because no matter what kind of pleasure you have in life, um, and there's nothing wrong with having a pleasure in life and enjoying your life, but no matter what kind of pleasure you have, that pleasure didn't die for you. That pleasure didn't sacrifice for you. That pleasure didn't stretch itself on a cross and suffer for you, but Jesus did. So uh, I don't think there's a big leap to give the Lord our best and not do it because we're trying to earn his love, because we don't have to earn his love. And not do it because we're trying to earn righteousness, because we can't earn righteousness, but do it be out of love. Do it because we love him. Do it because we desire him the same way we desire those other things. So that's why I think we're supposed to have a standard of excellence as believers. And that's why I think we're supposed to do things like start on time and give our best, because we're doing it as unto the Lord. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in today's lesson. I'm taking my gloves off. I think I still got my weightlifting gloves on. So... I'm going to talk about that a little bit today in today's live prophetic word about that very thing. But uh, yeah, but that's why that I'm a firm believer in starting on time. Firm believer in starting on time. When you go to the theater now, or when we used to go to the theater before the pandemic, you know, whenever they said the movie started, we knew that was just going to be a bunch of trailers, but at least they started it on time. So if call time is 1.45, the trailer started at 1.45, movie might not start till later, but... You know, so. So anyway, uh, so yeah, that's why I'm a firm believer in starting on time, because that's the least we can do, I think, for uh, everything that God has done for us. All right, it's 2.30, so we're going to jump right on in. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for this time, thank you, Lord, for another chance to to be used of you. Thank you for another chance, oh God, to hear from you, because the most precious thing we have is your word. And if there was a drought of your word, oh God, we couldn't live. We wouldn't know what to do if we can't hear from you. So thank you for the prophetic. Thank you for another chance to hear from you and to get in line with your will, your plans, and your purposes, for they are all good. They are all high, and they are all better than ours. So please forgive me for any sin and wash me clean. And fill me with the Holy Ghost right now, oh God. Uh, use me, breathe through me. I must decrease so you can increase. So let everything that is spoken be what you want, oh God, to the honor and the glory of your name, that you might be glorified, that demons might be terrified, that saints might be edified, and that sinners would be mortified, that they would not live one more day without knowing you, that they would fall on their faces saying, what must I do to be saved? Let the power of the Holy Ghost come through so strong that men and women, boys and girls are cut to their hearts, oh God, and they want to have a change of heart and a change of mind to become a part of you and your kingdom. I thank you for it and I believe you for it and signs and wonders and miracles are going to follow this word. We thank you for it and we believe you for it. In Jesus' name, we're looking for you to do mighty things. Amen. All right. Amen and amen. Now, today's live prophetic word is, have you learned your lesson? Today's live prophetic word is, have you learned your lesson? Let me put that on the screen on Facebook. Now, <clears throat> I can't speak to other cultures, but I can speak to African-American culture because I've been African-American all my life. When you would do something uh, that was out of line as a child, an African-American child, 
you might get a warning. You would get more warnings from your mother or from the women, from auntie and all them. You would get more verbal warnings from the women. Normally, your father, your grandfather, your uncle. They wouldn't talk but one time. But you get a warning if you're downstairs, for example, in the basement and all your cousins are over and all your siblings are down there. And you know how we can get as kids, we can get a little loud, we can get a little rough. You know, somebody going to start fighting or somebody tearing up stuff. And somebody opens up the basement door, some grown person, and says, y'all kids, stop, act, stop acting a fool down there. Y'all stop being so loud down there. It's too much noise. Okay? And they say it just like that. Too much noise in that basement. Y'all bring that noise down. I say, y'all stop that fight and stop all that fussing. Okay? Then they shut the door and go on back to grown folks' business. Okay? If you kept acting a fool, if you kept on with that noise level, if you kept on fighting, if you kept on tearing stuff up, what was going to happen? Okay, all the African-Americans watching me right now, you know the answer to that question, what was going to happen? What was going to happen is that your father, your grandfather, your uncle was coming down the steps and he wasn't coming down the steps talking. He was going, coming down the steps to regulate. He was coming down the steps to let you know that he's not pleased with your behavior, that he's not pleased with your disobedience, that he told you what to do. He told you to stop acting that way and you just threw that off like that didn't mean nothing. Okay? And then you know that behind was going to get towed up. And if you acted a fool over somebody else's house, even another relative, if I was at an aunt's house or a cousin's house and I acted a fool, you could get one whooping from, from the adult that was in charge of the house that you were at. Then when you got home, you was going to get another whooping for embarrassing your parents by acting a fool over at their house. African Americans know exactly what I'm talking about because that's exactly the way it used to be old school. You get that double whooping. Okay, you get that double whooping for acting up, and then you get another whooping for embarrassing your family, embarrassing your parents like that. Okay? What do you do when God whoops you? What do you do when God calls down from heaven and says, y'all stop acting a fool. Y'all stop cutting up down there. Y'all say, I don't like what I'm seeing. What do you do? Okay? What is your response when you get a chastisement from the Lord. Okay, now, once again, I'm going to speak to my fellow African Americans because what black people do when they whoop you, because they don't whip you, they whoop you. W-H-O-O-P, whoop, or W-H-U-P, whoop. They whoop you or they whoop you. They don't whip you. There's no I in it. What, what do black people do when, when you get a whipping, I'll tell you what we do. They talk to you. Didn't I tell you stop acting a fool like that? Didn't I tell you stop embarrassing me like that? Didn't I tell you leave that stuff alone? I can't speak to other cultures because I've never been anything other than African American, but I can speak to my culture. And I know that if you have pushed your parents to the whipping point, they don't just whip you, they talk to you while they're whipping you. You better hope you get whipped by your mom or your grandma or somebody female because somebody female would tend to whip you with a switch. And my grandmother used to make us walk in the backyard and get our own switches. That's the longest walk in the world. And you couldn't come back with a green switch that was soft and flexible and bendy. You had to come back with a brown switch that was dry and brittle. And that would hurt them thighs and hurt that behind when she lit it up. And my grandmother was like, if you come back here with a sorry switch, I'm going to make you go back and get a brittle one. Okay? Because you couldn't come back with a switch that was going to bend when it hit you. <laughs> OK, but you better hope you get whipped by somebody female because at least they would use a switch. If you got whipped by your dad, if you got whipped by your grandfather, if you got whipped by your uncle, what was going to happen? What were they going to use? They're going to use their hand. They're going to use their hand. I'm going to make sure everybody see my hand, everybody on Insta and everybody on Facebook. They're going to use their hand. 
You don't want no grown black man to whip you with his open hand. Just take my word for that. Okay? And while they was whipping you, they'd be steady talking. Didn't I tell you stop acting a fool? Yes, they would. I know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, they would. That's exactly what would happen. So what happens when Heavenly Father tells you you don't like what he's seeing? What happens when he Heavenly Father tells you that he's not pleased with your behavior? What happens when Heavenly Father tells you that you need to stop acting a fool? What happens then? How do you respond to that? How do you respond to the chastisement of God? Do you even recognize the judgment of God? Do you even recognize chastisement when you see it? Well, today's live prophetic word is entitled, Have You Learned Your Lesson? And we're going to look uh, specifically at the written word of God. We're going to look at a Bible verse like we always do. And then I'm going to share with you the rhema word of God, what the Lord is saying, what the Holy Ghost is saying as to how that verse relates to our situation. The verse of scripture we're going to look at is very familiar. We're going to look at Malachi chapter four, verses five and six. Actually, let me put that on the screen. I'm look at Malachi chapter four, verses five and six. Don't ever let anybody tell you that Malachi is not a powerful book. Malachi is an extremely powerful book. Okay, it's extremely powerful just because it's four chapters long. Malachi is something else. So we're going to look at Malachi chapter four, verse, verses five and six. I'm going to read as usual. Let me move my little Instagram camera. I'm going to read as usual out of a couple different translations. Oh, New International Version, Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Uh, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the father, uh, New International Version, he will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Uh, New Living Translation of verse 6. His preaching, Elijah's preaching, will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. English Standard Version of verse 6, Malachi 4 and 6. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Okay, and Malachi 4, 6, 4, 5, and 6, Berean Study Bible. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. Now, this is why anybody that's saying that the Bible is no longer relevant, that the Bible does not apply to today, that the Bible is somehow ancient, that the Bible is out of touch and out of date, okay? What did we just read? We just read that God said that before the great, uh, great and dreadful day of the Lord, he was going to send the spirit of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest God come and strike the land with a curse, lest he releases a decree of utter and total destruction, okay? What happened at the end of 2019? What happened in 2020? We got a global pandemic. What do you think that was, okay? Even if you think it may have originated in science, even if you think it may have been on purpose, whatever, that was the hand of God chastising this planet. And why? because he's not pleased with what he's seen with our families. That's why he said that the preaching of Elijah, the spirit of Elijah, has to turn the hearts of the parents or the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, or else God was going to smite the planet. Now, several years ago, I went out for Father's Day with my son. We go out every Father's Day, and we shared a meal. And I told him, according to the word of God, what we're doing here spending time together and fellowshipping and talking with each other. It's so important to God that if we don't do it, 
God didn't say he would smite a street. God didn't say he would smite a town. God didn't say he would smite a village. God didn't say he would smite a rural area. God didn't say he would smite a city. God didn't say he would smite a state. God didn't say he would smite a region. God didn't even say he would smite a nation. God said he would smite the planet. If God is not pleased with what he sees in our family situations, God said he would smite the earth with a curse. What happened in 2019 and 2020? That's why people can't tell me the Bible isn't real right now. You just lived it. You're still living it. Okay? So what's that got to do with us today? As I explained in the opening, what happens when your biological father or your stepfather or your father figure or your grandfather or your uncle, what happens when they've had enough of your behavior? When they come down them steps, they're not coming down them steps talking, they're coming down with chastisement. But they want to know, have you learned your lesson? After you get that whipping, after you get embarrassed in front of your siblings and your cousins, after you get them thighs toe up, after you get your behind toe up, do you go back and keep acting a fool? Do you want that to happen again? Did you learn anything from that experience? And that's what the Holy Ghost is trying to tell us about what's going on in our country today. I'm steady seeing, steady seeing people trying to go back to the old ways. Now, now specifically, I'm talking about the church. I'm not talking about technology or other industries. Specifically right now, I'm talking about the church or organized religion. I'm steady trying to build stuff back up that God took his mighty hand and tore down. He took his mighty hand and he tore it down. And I'm steady seeing people trying to build it back up. Okay, what do I mean specifically? Don't you know that at the end of 2014, God called for us to get rid of all religious denominationalism? So in other words, God called us together under the banner of Christ. Now, I know some people are going to say that's heresy. I know some people are going to call me a radical, that I'm talking about the one world church, which it has to do with the book of Revelation and the Antichrist. What I'm talking about is Jesus the Christ the son of the true and the living God. And like the Bible says, I cannot call him Lord if I wasn't saved. You only are able to call him Lord by the Holy Ghost. So if it was some kind of unclean spirit operating, I could not say Jesus is Lord. So there's your proof I'm actually saved and spirit filled. I'm not talking about the Antichrist. I'm not talking about the book of Revelation. I'm not talking about the one world church, the global church. I'm talking about the actual church that exists right now coming together under the head, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died for the church. God called us to put an end to denominationalism at the end of 2014. That's pushing up on seven years ago. You know why? Because God wanted, wanted to bring us together, like it says in the Bible. Now, you've been praying the Lord's Prayer since you were 10 years old. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed or reverence to thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, where? On earth as it is in heaven. Guess what it looks like in heaven when Apostle John the Revelator saw the throne of Father God and saw the throne of Jesus Christ and saw the seven spirits of God before the throne. When he saw the people, what did he see? He said, and I, John, saw all kindreds and tongues and peoples and nations bowing down, giving glory to the Lamb. In other words, there's no ethnic division in heaven. There's no color code. In heaven, John said, I saw some of everybody in the heavenly realm giving glory to God. That means that the church of Jesus Christ, that means those of us that calls our, call ourselves Christians and those of us that call ourselves believers, that's what it's supposed to look like on earth. Okay? Now, unless you think I'm making that up, I probably need to find that scripture for you so you, you understand I'm not making it up. Okay, that is well. One of them is uh, Revelation five, eight, and nine. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. 
And they sang a new song, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, because you were slain, and by your blood you purchased for God those from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Oh, there's my sister. Say hi to my sister. So John the Revelator says he saw when the he that he's talking about in verse 8 is Jesus. Jesus taking the scroll. The four living creatures and the 24 elders. 24 elders represents the fullness of believers. The 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of the Lamb. I fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So God counts our prayers as incense before him. And he says, and they sang a new song, worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and by your blood you purchased for God those from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Every tribe and tongue or language, people and nation. In other words, Jesus died for everybody to bring us all back to Father God, to bring us all into the, the kingdom of God. There's not a division. There's not a color line. There's not a, a, a division by ethnicity or language in the kingdom of heaven. We just read it in the scripture. So since we've been praying the Lord's prayer, since we were little, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what it's supposed to look like on earth. And there's a very specific reason for that. The reason for that is because God saw the spirit of racism coming. Because of course he did, okay? Because God sees everything. God knew that the spirit of racism was going to rear its ugly head again, although it never really goes away. We know that the spirit of racism never really goes away. That's an old demon. That's a very, very old demon, and it's rooted in the pride of man. That's why it's so hard to get rid of. You can get rid of it, but that's why it's so hard to break through a spirit of racism, because it's rooted in the pride of man that makes creatures made out of clay and breath, creatures made in God's image, think they're better than other creatures made out of clay and breath. Other creatures that are also made out of God's image. That's the spirit of racism that's rooted in the pride of man. And whenever you have a demon that appeals to your pride, you got to take a cross to that. You got to break off the demon, but you got to take a cross to your heart and a cross to your flesh. So that's why the spirit of racism is so hard to root out because you hate your fellow man just because they're different from you. Okay, many times you hate people, they haven't done anything to you. You hate them because they're different from you. You hate them because they look different, because they worship different, because they smell different, because their diet is different, because their language is different. So you hate them and you think you're better than them. Okay, that's like the elbow calling down to the knee and say, hey, knee, look at us. We bend this way because the elbow bends toward your body. And the knee says, well, we bend this way. Then the elbow says, well, you ain't saved. What? The elbow tells the knee that you ain't saved because you don't bend the way we do. That is what the body of Christ does. Telling other people that they're not saved for whatever reason, because you don't like their skin color, because they speak a different first primary language than you, because their ministry is different from yours. Don't you understand that every spot on the body of Christ has a function, just like every spot on your physical body has a function? Some parts of your body are your internal organs. That means you're going to live your whole life and not see them. The only time you see your internal organs is if there's been an accident or there's some type of ultrasound or x-ray because they're trying to make sure that everything's okay on the inside. Otherwise, you're going to live your whole life and not see your liver. You're going to live your whole life and not see your kidneys. You're going to live your whole life and not see your stomach. You're not supposed to. They're internal organs. You're going to live your whole life and not see your lungs. And if you see your lungs, you're in trouble. OK, what does that mean? That means some people are the internal organs of the body of Christ. You're never going to be the face of anything. You're going to live and die in obscurity. You're going to do what you do behind the scenes. It's not about being famous. It's not about being the face of a thing. Like some people, if you're the liver of the body of Christ, what that means is that you're the poison cleansers. A lot of people that are very strong on truth and very strong on holiness are the liver of the body of Christ. They need to cleanse the poison. A lot of teachers are the liver of the body of Christ because they want to flush out the poison. They want to flush out the lies. They want to flush out the toxicity. That's why you're that way. You're supposed to be that way. That doesn't mean that you're the eyes or the nose or the mouth. 
You're the liver. You're an internal organ. Nobody, nobody's ever going to call your name. You're going to live and die. Nobody's ever going to know who you are, but you're going to spend your life flushing toxicity and lies and poison out of the body because just like that's what the liver and the kidneys do in your natural body, that's what the liver of the body of Christ does. And we're running around here trying to tell other people that they're not saved because they don't do what we're called to do. That, that kind of thing was supposed to stop years ago. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. You have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers trying to bust on other offices, trying to bust on other callings and anointings because they don't do it like you do it. Every calling and anointing of God is specific, like your hand. Look at your hand. How is your hand laid out? You got four fingers and a thumb. Okay, your thumb cannot do the job of the pinky. The thumb is not the pinky. They're both part of your hand, but they're designed certain ways and they do certain things. The apostolic anointing is very specific. The word apostle means sent one. You're a sent one. And so many times God will call through the apostolic, call people to set up churches, call people to set up the word of God in a dry space, a space where there is no word. So God going to call you there to bring the word. That's not the same as a shepherd. A shepherd is there to shepherd the souls and love the people once things get set up. Sometimes the apostolic call comes to a shepherd, but sometimes apostles plant churches and they move on. And sometimes apostles get killed because they pioneer stuff. They go out there first because they're sent ones. That's not what we do. Prophets are different. It's now your prophetic anointing can be laced with the apostolic and it can be laced with the evan evangelical. But what we do is say what thus said the Lord, let the chips fall where they may. Okay, let the chips fall because as a prophet, God is not going to ask you when he judges you, did the people like you? God is going to ask you, did you say what I told you to say? OK, and that's why we have the personalities that we do. That's why we have the temperament that we do. And that's why God trains us the way he does, because we have to say things that other people won't say. That's why prophets have that kind of boldness. OK, and if you don't have that kind of boldness, the Holy Ghost will push it out of you. Haven't you ever seen a prophet start talking and the tongues just start flowing out of them and the power of God fall on them? Because the Holy Ghost is going to get the word out of you if he has to. If you meek and quiet and that's not your way, the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you and that mouth is going to open and say, well, thus saith the Lord, because that's what we do. That's the prophetic anointing. That's not missionaries. That's not the evangelist anointing. The evangelist anointing is designed to win souls. An evangelist will sell everything they have, move to other countries, change their diet, learn a new language, because evangelists burn with the desire to win people in the kingdom. But normally, once they win people, they're ready to move on to the next people to be one. That's why you have shepherds. You see that? Can you see those are all different functions, all different anointings? Now you can have more than one of those, but you always have a core anointing. And at my core, I'm a prophet. I'm not a pastor, okay? So the point I'm trying to make is that how are we gonna be busting on each other? That's like your hand, talking about the other members of the hand because they don't work the way you work. The pinky don't do what the thumb does. The index finger don't do what the thumb does. How are you going to say that other people aren't saved? How are you going to say that other people are, are, are whatever you're talking about them because they don't do it like you do it? Can't you see that is division, division, two visions? Can't you see that's not from God? Because we got one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, one God, Father above us all, one Holy Spirit, and one Bible. But we're still arguing. The nose is arguing with the mouth. The ears are arguing with the eyes, trying to tell them that they ain't saved because they don't do it the way you do it. You got two eyes and they set in your head. You got two ears. They set on the side of your head. If somebody interviews your ears and somebody interviews your eyes about your life, same life, they both tell different stories. Don't you know your visual life isn't the same as your audio life? Don't you know that's not the same story? Aren't they both a part of your body? But we're so busy trying to tell people that they not saved because they don't do it like we do it. And when unbelievers see that, the Lord told me to release to the body of Christ. When unbelievers see that, we confuse the world. We confuse unbelievers. We confuse sinners because I had one 
One of my best friends told me last year, he said, David, when people tell me that they're a Christian, I no longer know what that means. When he told me that, uh, that was just confirmation to me, once again, that we have failed. Because we have a white Jesus, we have a Mexican Jesus, we have black Jesus, we have a white Holy Ghost, we have a black Holy Ghost, we have people, you know, we have people on the baptism, people on Presbyterians, Lutherans, uh, Methodists, United Methodists, African Methodists, Episcopalian. We got a whole bunch of denominations all saying that we do it right. But we do it right over here. But see, you ain't really saved unless you do this. But you ain't really saved unless you do that. You ain't really saved unless you ABC. Admit you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God sent from heaven and down on the cross from your sins. Rose again the third day and confess that with your mouth as you believe it in your heart. That's when you got saved. If you didn't do that, you ain't saved. That's whether you saved or not. ABC. Admit, believe, confess. The other things are your spot in the body. Your spot in the body. Once you come into the kingdom, then God is going to put you where he wants you according to purpose. And God is going to anoint you. He's going to give you of his power, of his spirit, according to what it is that he wants you to do. If you don't have a scribe anointing, then don't be trying to write. If you, if you don't, are not anointed to prophesy, there's a level of prophecy that we're all supposed to walk in. Okay, all Christians, 1 Corinthians 14, were all supposed to prophesy. I'm talking about the office of a prophet. If you're not anointed to walk in the office of a prophet, you can't appoint yourself to the prophetic office. That's something the Holy Ghost does. But we're running around doing all this stuff, embarrassing our Heavenly Father, arguing with each other, telling other people that they're not saved because they don't do it like we do it. And God just smote the planet to get our attention. Why do you think we had all that isolation time in 2020? Because it was time for you as an individual, not your church, not your denomination, not your whatsoever. It was time for you to get alone somewhere and find out, do I know the voice of God? Do I know when the Lord is talking to me? Do I have the correct interpretation and understanding of the scriptures? Where is my heart? Am I fulfilling the first and great commandment? Do I love the Lord with all that I have? And am I fulfilling the second one that's like into it? Do I love myself? And am I loving my neighbor as myself? Because the Lord said on them to hang all the law and the prophets, which means if you're not doing that, then what are we doing with our Christian lives? So 2020 was a season. The reason for that season, the reason there was such global isolation in entire nations, literally. Because remember, Italy and Japan went on lockdown early. Entire nations were on lockdown was so that you could get alone somewhere and ask, find out the state of your relationship with God. Do I know the voice of God? Do I know it for myself? Because you couldn't get to your pastor except online. You couldn't get to your prophet except online. You couldn't get to your evangelist except online. You sitting up there in the house by yourself. That was the point of the isolation for God to talk to you, you personally. Do you have that personal relationship with God? That was the point of the isolation and for us to hear what the spirit is saying to the church. And God has been telling us for years now that that religious denominationalism, that racism in the body of Christ, that division has got to go. Because God wants his body to be a picture to the unbelievers that we can, as humans, all get along under the banner of Christ. We cannot do it on our own. Haven't we proven by now that we can't get along with each other in our own strength? How, what else is it going to take before humanity and before Christians feels like that getting along with each other is not our strong suit as people? We can't do it. We need the Holy Ghost. We need the word of God. We need the love of Christ. We need the power of the spirit of God. Okay? And we, and when I say we, I mean Christians, are supposed to be a city set on a hill. We're supposed to be a light. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. We're supposed to be showing people that don't know God what his love is like. Where is the love? Where is the grace? 
I still see people out there preaching a works-based salvation. You're going to earn yourself, at Lord Jesus. The Bible says that your righteousness is like filthy rags in English. In Hebrew, what that scripture actually says is that your righteousness is like, oh, there's my other sister. Let me say hi to my sister. What it really says in Hebrew is that your righteousness is like a menstruating woman's rags. What God said in the Bible is that you trying to self-justify yourself is like a woman on her period and the rag she used to, to, to clean up her period. That's what God said. That's what is in the Bible. That's in the Hebrew. A menstruating woman's rags. He said your righteousness is like used tampons. That's in the scripture. That's why you need to read the Bible. So I still see people out here preaching a works-based salvation as if you got saved based on what you do. As if you stay saved based on your own strength. We got saved because Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood. And then through faith, his blood is applied to our account. And then God justifies us before him. He remits our sins because of the blood of Christ. Not because of what we do. And then for the way God wants us to live, he gives us grace. And the Holy Spirit gives us power. It's not our own power and our own strength. But you still got people out here that don't understand grace. Don't you know that the grace of God, God can just give you stuff? God can just open his hand and give you stuff because he loves you? God doesn't base what he does on our goodness. God bases what he does on his goodness. When God made the world and turned it over to Adam, he said that'll be 99.99. No, he didn't. He just gave it to him. How much do we pay God for Jesus? How much do we pay Father God to send Jesus from heaven and die on the cross? For us? How much, what'd that cost? You don't earn this. You don't earn this. So where's the love? Where's the grace? Okay. Where's the miracles? When the Lord Jesus Christ walked this earth as a man, his life was marked by miracles. Where are the miracles as believers? Now, I'm speaking for my family. I'm not going to give details, but I'm going to say in my family, we saw back-to-back -back medical miracles. Okay. I'm not talking about years and years ago. I'm talking about a couple months ago. We saw the power of God intervene when medical science said this was going to happen and blah, 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 blah. And we saw the mighty hand of God come down and change the situation. Where are the miracles in your life? Where's the love? Where's the grace? Where's the miracles? Okay, where is the power of God manifesting? Are we looking like Jesus looked when he walked the earth? Are we doing, are we pulling people up out of wheelchairs? Are we getting rid of cancer? You do know that cancer is a demon, right? Uh, that's another ministry, deliverance. A whole lot of Christians don't believe in deliverance. I don't care if you don't believe it. It's in the scripture and the Lord did it. Now, deliverance is mentioned in the Old Testament because when the evil spirit came upon King Saul, King David played his harp and the evil spirit went away. So deliverance is mentioned in the Old Testament. But the Lord pioneered the deliverance ministry in terms of calling demons by name. Because the Lord taught us that when you're dealing with an unclean spirit, you got to identify it and call it by name. Jesus did that. And the Lord taught us that we're supposed to do it too. So where's the deliverance? Because cancer is a demon, if you didn't know that. If you're dealing with something, you're dealing with any kind of cancer, if you want to break it, you have to cast the demon out first. Ear cancer, breast cancer, throat cancer, stomach cancer, prostate cancer, bone cancer, breast cancer, I don't care what it is. It's a demon. You have, to, you have to break the power of the unclean spirit, and then sometimes your body will push the poison out. Sometimes your body will eject the cancerous cells once the power of the demon is broken, if you didn't know that. That's why a lot of people struggle with chronic illness for years, because they were never taught deliverance. That thing is not just in the natural. Oh, man, my computer cut off, so my Facebook cut off, but my Instagram is still going having issues with my computer. Uh, but anyway, my Insta is still going. That thing is not just in the natural. That thing is in the spiritual. And that's why you have to break the power of an unclean spirit when you're dealing with chronic illness. It's not just rooted in the natural, okay? And that is deliverance ministry. That is demonology. And a whole lot of Christians don't even know that a whole lot of Christians don't even want to deal with it. If it's in the Bible and if the Lord did it, we're his body. Do we get that? If it's in the scriptures and Jesus dealt with it, we're supposed to do it. So are you pulling people up out of wheelchairs like Peter and John did? Are you healing people that are humpbacked like Jesus did? Are you multiplying food? Are you stopping funerals like the Lord did with the damsel, with the little girl that died? 
Are you breaking demons off of people? Are you opening blinded eyes? Where are the miracles? Don't tell me that was just for the Bible day. I told you. Not only did I see it growing up, but I've seen it in my family, and I'm talking about in, in the last recent months, where there was no way the doctors were talking one thing, and we saw the mighty hand of God jump in it and turn that whole thing around. This is what I'm trying to tell you. Where are the so where's the love? Where's the grace? Where's the deliverance? Where's the miracles? Are we walking in what we're supposed to be walking in as the body of Christ? Or are we still arguing about, first you say the scripture, then we do the prayer. Are we still arguing on, no, we were white on first Sunday. Are we still arguing about who's going to bring pastor his water while he's preaching? Are we still arguing about, I don't like that style of music, so we're going to throw out the worship team or we're going to get a new worship leader? Are we still arguing about things that don't mean anything? That's religion. That's form and fashion. That's why I don't have no power. Don't you know people are not supposed to wheel in your church and wheel out? If they wheelchair in your church, they're supposed to leave out walking. I know some of y'all, that's the first time in your life. I know some of y'all never heard anybody say that. You're not supposed to have sick people come to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and stay sick. That amazes me. That is minimizing the, the miracle healing ministry of Jesus because that is not how the Lord lived when he walked the earth as a man. Anybody that came to the Lord in faith, the Bible says he healed them all. Paralytics, blinded people, people that had never walked, uh, people with all kinds of illness and diseases, people that were mentally ill, people that were demon oppressed. The Bible says the Lord had compassion on them and he healed them all. There was nobody that came to Jesus with a chronic anything. Sometimes those people have been sick for decades where they left the same way they came. You can't find that nowhere in the Bible. The only time was in Nazareth where he said he could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief, not because of his lack of power, not because of his lack of willingness, not because the Lord wasn't willing, and not because the Lord wasn't able, but they didn't believe it, okay? And God does not move over on top of your will. God does not force you. God does not make you do anything. You have a choice. And so what the Holy Spirit wanted me to deliver today was to let people know that Christians, the body of Christ, did we learn our lesson from 2020? God whipped and chastised the entire planet. God tore down all those religious systems. God tore down all those things that we did that didn't have no power. Hat parade. Uh, people argue if you park too close to the pastor's parking space, people get mad at you for that. Arguing about who sits on the end corner seat on the second row on the left-hand side of the church because Mama Nellie been sitting there for the last 50 years and how dare you take her seat. Arguing about, arguing on the usher board, arguing. Arguing about stuff that don't mean nothing about nothing. Where is the love, the unconditional love of God? Where is the grace where we're preaching and teaching people that the joy of the Lord is righteousness without works? That the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven is that you don't have to earn your way in. Jesus paid the price and God will give it to you by grace through faith. You have to believe it and receive it. You don't have to earn it. It's already been bought and paid for. Where's the teaching of grace? Where's the deliverance ministry where we are casting out demons? You got people going to church, been sick ever since you've known them. That is not the reflection of how Jesus lived when he walked the earth as a man. And where is the miracles? Where are the miracles? Where's the miracle ministry where the Holy Spirit is there? I saw a video of a woman whose arm was a stump, like her hand was up here where my shoulder was. And they prayed for that woman. They spoke in tongues over that woman and they poured water on that woman. And I saw the arm extend all the way. And no, it wasn't a special effect. And no, it wasn't a fake. Where's that? Where people are growing new limbs. Where's that? Where people come in your service blind and they walk out seeing. Where is that? See, when you talk to a lot of religious people about being actual Christians, they get mad. <laughs> That's why there's so much division. What about being an actual Christian and walking in the love of God? 
What about being an actual Christian and walking in the grace of God and sharing the good news that you don't have to earn your right standing with God? Jesus already paid for it. What about being an actual Christian and walking in deliverance ministry and casting out unclean spirits in your house, start in your house? Don't know unclean spirit have the right to have any type of influence in your house if you're a believer. Start with your heart, with your house. Start with your holy oil. Start go room to room. Start with the ground your house is built on. Don't know unclean spirit. Whatever happened on that ground that your house is built on, you can, ca you can apply the blood of Jesus and you can break anything unclean. If you have strange stuff happening in your house, like strange noises, like uh, if you think they're unclean spirits, if you get headaches when you go in certain rooms, if you see things at night, that them spirits don't have the right to have dominion over you if you are a Christian. Start in your house and break the power of the devil in your house. And what about breaking the power of the devil in sickness? And what about the miracles? Okay, did we learn anything from 2020? Are we looking? Uh, are, is the body of Christ just as racist as unsaved people? Do we look like it looks in heaven? Is his will being done on earth as it is in heaven? Okay, and that's what the Holy Spirit wanted me to share today. Have we learned our lesson? We are not supposed to be walking in racism. We're not supposed to be walking in religion in form and fashion. We're supposed to be walking in the love of God. The love of God is not human love. It's beyond human. It's a love that will make you pray for those that curse you and bless those that curse you and pray for those that spitefully use you. That's Jesus' love in you. That's not human. The grace of God, okay, is what saves us. We don't have to earn our right standing before him. That means anybody can have it. If it's not based on what we do, that means anybody can have it. Anybody can be saved. You can't be too good to be saved. You can't be too bad to be saved. You can't be too young to be saved. You can't be too old to be saved. The only thing you can be is too late. Other than that, other than you have died and gone to judgment, there is nothing the blood of Jesus doesn't cover but unbelief. Because God does not force his love or his grace on anyone. God offers. He opens his hand. And if you want to take his offer, God will save you today, right now as I'm talking. You don't have to live one more day of your life as an unbeliever. You can become born again right now and get your sins forgiven. The blood of Jesus covers your sins past, present, and future. And God gives you a promise once you step into Christ of no condemnation. You will never see hell. You say, how is such a thing possible? Because it's the grace of God. It's not a plan that we came up with. It's not something we thought up. It's not something we deserve. And it's not something we earn. It's his grace and his grace alone that he might get the glory in all things. Where is that? Do you understand that? A whole lot of believers don't understand none of what I just said. And they walk around talking about that people ain't saved because some women might wear a dress that's a little bit below the knee. And some women, them super saved women, got dresses down to the ankles. And the super saved women are telling them women that have a skirt that drop below the knee that they ain't really saved because they ain't modest enough. Modesty is the mark of a Christian woman, yes, but not to earn your salvation. That is not what makes you saved. It's a reflection of loving the Lord, not trying to earn your way in the kingdom. And you're saying that you're more saved than other people. No, you're not. We all got, if you saved, we all got saved the same way, by faith in the blood of Christ and by believing on his death, burial, and resurrection. That's how you got saved. That's the only way to be saved. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's how we got saved. Ain't but one way. Okay? So, did we learn our lesson? Are we trying to rebuild things that God took his mighty hand during 2020 and just tore all the way down? Are we trying to rebuild that? Have we learned our lesson? So the challenge today as I close is for us, because America is in the valley of decision. What do I mean by that? That means God is watching what we do now. And that's what's going to determine what happens next. If we repent and turn as a nation, then God will forgive our sins and heal our land. If we turn back to the Lord Jesus Christ with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. That has to happen with the church first because unbelievers don't know the Lord. How can unbelievers do that? 
How can they do that? They don't have a relationship with Jesus. When the Bible says judgment must first begin at the house of God, that does not just mean God judges us first. That's true, but that's not what that means. That's not all it means. It also means that if judgment is going to be released on the earth, it starts with the saints. So we as Christians have to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and get past our racism and get past our denominationalism and hear what the Spirit is saying because as a nation, we are in the valley of decision. And what we do now is going to determine what comes next because if we don't learn our lesson, if we keep acting a fool, remember I started out the broadcast by talking about what your grandfather would do to you if he shouted down the steps and warned you to stop acting a fool and you didn't listen. What we do now is going to determine what's coming next. If we turn back to the Lord, we're in an Acts chapter 10 moment. We have to cast down all of our religious training, throw that away and listen to what is the Lord saying now? What is the Lord telling us to do now? How is Jesus calling us together? That may not look like, I know what I'm saying is going to be considered radical. I know people are going to say I'm crazy. I know people are going to say it's heretical. I don't care. Acts chapter 10, the Lord told Peter to rise and slay and eat a bunch of unclean beasts. And Peter rebuked the Lord and said, I eat kosher. I've never eaten anything unclean. Neither has it touched my lips. And the Lord said, that which I have cleansed, don't you call it common. The Lord was telling Peter to turn his back on a lifetime of religious training and accept the Gentiles. Just last week, them same Gentiles that work on the Sabbath and worship false gods, false idols, and eat bacon and ham and eat the pig and disrespect their parents, them Gentiles, last week they was heathens and dogs. This week, God said, I've accepted them. I've led them in the kingdom and they got the Holy Ghost just like you do. And if I've cleansed it, don't you call it common. Don't you understand that was radical? To Peter, don't you stand, understand that was radical in his day? Don't you understand that, that didn't nobody see that coming? Didn't nobody, after God had been dealing with Israel from Abraham all the way through Christ, and all of a sudden God opened up the kingdom to the Gentiles and said, well, now it's time for the Gentiles to be saved. Now it's time for them to come on in. Don't you understand that that was, didn't nobody see that coming? That was radical to those people. And a lot of people said it was heresy. Saul of Tarsus was one of them. Remember? Before Saul of Tarsus got converted to become Paul the Apostle, he said Christianity was radical. He said Christianity needed to be shut down. He was a licensed Christian killer. And then he met Jesus, and Jesus turned his life around. So I don't care if I sound crazy. I don't care if you think it's radical. I don't care if you think it's heretical. Okay? We are in that kind of time in this country where the believers have to hear what the Lord is saying because the way the Lord is calling us together now might not look like anything your church, your denomination, your ethnic group has ever done in the past. Do you understand? That's where we are right now. If we hear God now and come together under the banner of the head of the church, Next time somebody saying whatever they saying to you, do this test. Ask them to stick their hands out. Stick, stick the palms of your hands out like that. Uh huh. Do you see any nail prints? Then you ain't the head. I'm not the head of the church. You ain't the head. Jesus is the head. He's the one who got the nail prints in his palms. He's the one who got the proof in his body that he paid the price on the cross and that he died and came back. He's the head of the church. How you think you're going to tell the head of the church what to do? How you think you're going to tell the head of the church how it has to go? Just because we've been doing things a certain way for many years doesn't mean anything if God is calling us to something new. Good God Almighty, that was worth the price of tea right there. Just because we've been doing something a certain way for decades doesn't mean God is not now calling us to something new. Do you understand? So just like God called Peter and them during the first century, during the first church, the early church, to open up the kingdom to the Gentiles, that was unprecedented. How do you know the Lord is not calling us together in a new way 
that we haven't seen before right now. And you can only discern that way if you hear it from Jesus. That means the church has to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. That's why you got to walk in the prophetic. That's why you have to have your own daily quiet time. That's why you got to know the scriptures. That's why you have to have your own walk with God. That's why, because that's the kind of time we're in. If we hear God now, then God will forgive our sins and hear the Lamb. But if we, as the body of Christ, don't get the ball rolling, do you know what's going to happen? Worse things than COVID are coming. Oh, Prophet Taylor, you just crazy. Uh-huh. I don't care if you think I'm crazy. I really don't. Prophets, we always sound crazy till what we say comes to pass. If we don't get ourselves together as the body of Christ under the head of the church, not your denomination, not your skin color, not your ethnic group, not your language, not your traditions. Jesus only, whatever that's going to look like from this point forward, only the Lord can determine that. If we, as the body of Christ, don't do that, then worse things than COVID are coming. I personally don't want to go through another year like 2020. Because 2020 was rough. Rough in ways that, that, that very few of us saw coming. I don't want to go through another year like that. I don't want my family to go through another year like that. Okay? So if we don't listen, that's exactly what's going to happen. Worse things than COVID-19 are coming. Because we didn't learn our lesson from the whooping we got. We just got. All right? I'm going to leave it right there. Uh, praise God. Thanks to all of you that watched me live. Uh, Facebook cut out, I know, right before I uh, got through. So what I'm going to do is download this video and I'll upload it so you can see the whole message because I know it cut off right in the middle. But I'll put the whole message up uh, on Facebook and on YouTube. So because you have to watch this message from the beginning, you can't jump in the middle. But watch this message from the beginning so, so you can get what the Holy Spirit is trying to give you from have we learned our lesson? Wait. For behold, my people, I do speak to you this day, and I command you to come together under my headship, for I am he that trieth the reins and the hearts. I am he that judges the church. I am he that walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks and has the seven stars in my hand. I am he that gives the grades, and I'm calling you to me. I'm calling you to do what I command you to do, not your traditions or your religion, but to get into place and do what I told you to do. It doesn't matter if you understand it. It doesn't matter if you like it. It doesn't matter if it's what you thought. I am the Lord and the master. I am he that was dead and alive forevermore. I am the Alpha and the Omega, and I'm calling you my body. For when you are disobedient to me, you are bones out of joint. You cause me pain. The testimony of the kingdom is weakened when you are not living the way I've called you to live. And that means that people that could be getting saved, that should be getting saved, aren't getting saved because they can't see you in me because you are still Lord of your own life. You are still on the throne. You are still in the driver's seat. But I called you from the beginning. I told you that if any man would come after me, let him first take up his cross and deny himself and follow me. I'm calling you to a crossed life. I'm calling you to a life of self-denial. I'm calling you to a life where you follow me so that people might see me in you. And it's when they see me in you that the Spirit of God will convict them. They will see me in you. They will hear my words coming out of your mouth. And they will fall down on the ground and say, what must I do to be saved? I'm establishing that this day going forward that I expect my body my children, my bride, to hear my voice and obey. And if not, then worse things, worse judgments, judgments that you cannot imagine, will be coming. And the land will be cursed and barren and desolate. For I am a jealous God. 
and I want fidelity. I want loyalty. I want the love of my bride. I want my people to listen to me. And I want all of my bones, muscles, organs, tendons, ligaments to get into place and function and work as I have designed you to function so that those that are without, those that are outside of the kingdom, those that do not believe can see me and be saved, says the spirit of the living God. Wow. Wow. So we have a responsibility. This is a responsibility we've always had. Okay, so the Holy Spirit gave it to us through the written word and the Holy Spirit confirmed it through the rhema word. So I'm trying to be as obedient as I know how because I want to stay in my place. That's why I'm out here prophesying. And you need to get in obedience because we don't want to go through 2020 again with something worse. Today's prophetic word was, have you learned your lesson? Have you? And that's it for today. I will see you this Thursday at 7 o'clock p.m. for my No More Genie series. Thursday night, 7 o'clock p.m. for No More Genies, our next installment. And I'll see you next Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Now, remember I told you uh, every video, my goal for 2021 is to increase my reach because I'm trying to get more people exposed to the prophetic word. Because when the Spirit of God releases a prophetic word, then as many people as possible need to hear it. So my goal for 2021 is to increase my reach. So every video I told you I was going to ask you to do one thing because I can't do that by myself. So the one thing I want you to do in this video is I want you to share my newsletter. Those of you that are on my newsletter list, I want you to pick at least one friend that you know that uh, walks in the prophetic or is interested in the prophetic or wants to grow in the prophetic and just forward them my newsletter. OK, so they can uh, uh, begin to drink and benefit from all that the Holy Spirit has given me. OK, just forward my newsletter to one person. Now, if you have a list, of course, that's better. But if you know just one person that could be edified and blessed by the prophetic, then just take the newsletter. Those of you that are on my newsletter list and just forward it to one person. All right. Amen and amen. God bless you. I'm, that message made me sober. I'm challenged by that message. I'm encouraged. Uh, by that message, but that's a sobering word from God. All right. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you Thursday and I'll see you next Sunday. God bless.